What she sees as some of the most common self-defeating behaviors, how are we able to promote and market our business in today's environment? How you as a business owner might be able to look at some of the old school ways of marketing and bring them fresh and new in your business to help grow and scale it. So buckle up, it's gonna be a great session. Maui Mastermind presents the Business Coach Podcast, answering your questions and providing real actionable insights for building a better, stronger, more profitable business business without sacrificing your time, life, or freedom anymore. Well, welcome to The Business Coach. We have a real treat in store for you today. I'm going to be interviewing Jennifer Martin, business coach and serial entrepreneur. Now, I've had the honor and privilege of working with Jennifer now for multiple years. She and I have shared the stage at various business owner conferences that we've both spoken at, keynoted at. Jennifer is someone whose background starts with years ago, over 20 years ago, where she bought her first failing business, turned it around, sold it for a profit, and then she got the bug. She got the entrepreneurial bug, and since then she's done that half a dozen times where she's bought a failing business or bought a business. She fixed what was going on with it, scaled it, and then exited and sold it, and now she's been doing that as a business coach where she's been helping clients to help scale their companies. And she's fantastic. She works with so many of the Maui clients. She's spoken at a number of our conferences. And in this interview, you're going to hear about her talking about what she sees as some of the most common self-defeating behaviors business owners have. We're going to get into pricing and how to actually set pricing and the mistakes that business owners make with pricing in their businesses. Probably my favorite part of the interview, and I think what you're going to take away huge from, is we started talking about how our be able to promote and market our business in today's environment. Jennifer's got some really unique ideas about that. She's someone who has deep expertise on the marketing side of that part. And we're talking in there about how some of the old school ways of marketing have become new and fresh again. And, and, and whether it be canvassing or direct mail, and she's gonna share some direct experiences with that, um, examples, case studies of how you as a business owner might be able to look at some of the old school ways of marketing and bring them fresh and new in your business to help grow and scale it. So buckle up, it's gonna be a great session. We're getting a chance to meet Jennifer Martin. Well, Jennifer, thank you for joining me at The Business Coach. How are you doing today? Thank you, David. I am really excited to be with you this afternoon. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Now, uh, it's fun, Jennifer. We get a chance to, to, to co-teach at various times at various uh, business coaching events that we're doing or work with clients and share clients at times. One, one of the comments I'll have for you, just you wouldn't even have known this. I haven't told you this, but I was talking with a coaching client yesterday who had sent three of his team members, including his most important manager, to the, a, a recent workshop that you were the one teaching called Systems and Controls. And they said that this guy, Ed, loved the workshop and thought of all the different speakers that were there. And we had, I believe, four of our business coaches were there mm -hmm. speaking. He said, Jennifer was my favorite. So I wanted to start oh. that off. So the bar is very high today in this conversation. <laughs> yeah, thank you. That's always nice to get the feedback. So I appreciate that. And I'm glad that he found value. That's fantastic. Now, I, one of my favorite things to do is to start with the business that you first got started with. Why? Because you know, everyone gets to see the after picture. This is Jennifer after 20 plus years of building, scaling companies, coaching other people. But I want to go backwards, you know, 20 plus years into the past. And I want to ask you, you know, looking back at that first business you ever ran, what was something about how you ran that first business that you can today look back and, and you can playfully laugh at young Jennifer way back when of how silly or naive, and we all have it. I've shared some of mine in past podcasts. What would it be for you? Yeah. Well, the first business that I actually opened, I was 19 and I opened a concierge business and I was the sole proprietor. And mainly I just help people uh, solve problems and acquire things. But I think one of the early businesses that I learned the most from was a restaurant and catering company that I owned in Portland, Oregon called Epicure. And I bought this business, it was losing $15,000 a month. So it was, you know, already in the stressful uh, zone. And I actually closed escrow three weeks before September 11th. So it was, you know, to say that it was a lesson in so many different things. Um, I think that was probably the business that I learned the most from. 
Yeah. Wow. I can't, I mean, the only, the only positive there for you in that scenario was at least you're on the other side of the country, but even still, that was a strange time, I'm sure, to own a business like that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It, I think um, within 30 days of purchasing the business, we lost 90% of our clientele. So it was a, you know, it was a big challenge, but I had a plan. So I'll just say, um, the first four months, because I didn't know any better, I was the catering manager, the marketing director, the manager of the restaurant, the bookkeeper. And to save money, I did all the purchasing. I made employee schedules, you know, maintained the website, was at the Chamber of Commerce. I took home sure. laundry and I was a, a server and the closing dishwasher. And I would never recommend, in hindsight, I would never <laughs> recommend to someone uh, to do that, I was just, I was running as fast as I could, seven days a week, 12 hours a day, doing everything myself. And I didn't have a mentor and it did, it never occurred to me that I could pay someone else to do the basics and then free myself up to do the A-level work. I, I thought I had to do it all. And, you know, yeah. I thought nobody would care as much as I did. So. And that was one of the five companies that you sold. And I'm, I'm curious now, we're going to shift the gears a little bit. You've worked with lots of different people, business owners in, in a variety of different industries, verticals with different types of business models. What's one of the biggest things that you observe that these business owners have, have done to themselves? Like, you know, when you get started working with them, you see their past behaviors. What as a business owner was a, a, a pattern of a past dumb behavior that you see common to many business owners who are essentially lone wolves doing it themselves. They just can't see this for themselves. Yeah, I think probably, you know, as I experienced myself, that part of me that was afraid if I wasn't working 10 plus hours a day, then I'd fall behind or that part of me that thought it takes too much time to teach somebody how to do this the right way. So I think that was probably that is a consistent challenge that I see with people and to some extent with almost almost every business owner. It's interesting. Yeah. You know, I, I, the, hey, um, Janine, I think you really could, could get someone else to do this particular responsibility. And she says, well, maybe, but it just takes so much more time to show somebody else and to manage them. I can just do it myself. What, what, what does that cost the, that business owner? Oh, my goodness. Well, uh, you know, to start, I'm going to I'm going to quote you, but we call that control, a little control itis or inflammation of the control gland. And I think what it costs the business owner is they're they get caught up in this never ending trap. There's no getting out. So it can cause burnout. And, you know, for the business. Uh, this limited thinking may hold the business back from scaling, from financial growth, and there's there's never ever any freedom. You know, it's just a constant hamster wheel. So I think that you know the the impact for the business owner mostly could be burnout and never an opportunity to grow beyond where they are right now. Give us an example of how you coach somebody out of that loop, so that a listener or a viewer is watching or listening to this. He or she could say, you know what, I, I could see myself doing that to fix that piece of it or to improve that piece of it that for me can see that I was overly controlling in the business. How would you coach someone out of that? Sure. So, you know, a little story. Um, I worked with this gentleman named Ted and he when he came aboard for coaching, he told me that his wife told him she wanted a divorce from the business. So you could tell it was he was really in it, probably working seven days a week, literally eight to 14 hours a day. And the reality was he didn't have enough gas left in the tank at the end of the day to be present for his wife, his kids. And he was also afraid at 56 that he would have a heart attack and die at 58 just like his father did so you know one of the first things that uh that ted did when we when we identified that there was this control itis issue was i'll say it's simple but he made a decision to get to get support and he uh, he hired a professional coach obviously who'd worked with hundreds of clients just like him me and and he had um i was able to take him through a clearly defined system to change things and so that 
he could get out of this endless cycle of despair, you know? So, yeah, I mean, obviously there was step by step there, but I think the, the first biggest change for him was to recognize that he did not want to stay in this pattern and he didn't have to go it alone. I love it. So the decision that he was going to change it, that the status quo was unacceptable. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing that that then the decision to take outside help, whether they're outside help be in the form of team members or staff, uh, mm -hmm. an outside process or structure, or even an outside counselor or coach. And I love that. And I, hearing that, my experiences have been that many business owners use the excuse of, well, they think that they would have to change all this at once where the reality is from that decision, it's not like all of a sudden the business has changed or he's changed. It's a incremental process, more like a, a dimmer or light switch that, that's not on off, but it becomes brighter, brighter, brighter as quarter by quarter by quarter, we start to like a rheostat change that light level. Has that been consistent with your experience, Jennifer? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, absolutely. I think uh, for this particular man, he, he had what I call white knight syndrome and he loved being the helper and the person who was saving the day. And so, you know, maybe a first step with control itis or white knight, which is nothing wrong with wanting to serve people and be of support, but he had to think bigger. Uh, and I always, I challenge my clients to rather than think about this as, you know, my business, my baby, to start thinking about it as our company or this corporation, because we make different decisions when we come back from a more expansive view. And so that was maybe the, the first step he said, yeah, he took was just to change his mindset so that he didn't have to be the Google for his business and know everything. And then I'll say maybe, you know, a great next step or, you know, a clear actionable step for him was to get very, very clear around what his A-level work was, uh, to stop doing the entry-level work and really to give his business the most bang for its buck by giving him, creating the freedom to um, identify what he could do that would move the needle the most. So it was just an entirely different way of looking at his participation and, you know, of course, getting the team involved and things like that. I'm going to ask you what happened out of this, knowing it's not a finished story because, you know, people grow over time with that part, but where the story is today. But something you said there just really struck me, and I actually wrote it. You see me furiously taking notes as you're talking here, and anyone who's watching and listening, I, I'm hoping you're doing it with a pen and, and paper in hand, but but you said this, he, he made the shift from this is my business to this is our business or this is the business or the company. There's a little bit of emotional distance or a little bit more inclusivity. It just, it's a, a way of, 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 of revealing how you feel about the business relative to other people having participation or not. The person who says, my, 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 controlling. The person who says, our, hey, this is our business and here's what I'm needing from you. Here's what the company is expecting from you. That's a great distinction. I like the way you looked at the language with that. How is the story with Ted today? Here we are later. Uh, oh, fa fantastic. And I'm, I'm gonna give one more quick analogy that there was the, the game changer for him yeah. and then I'll, I'll give a quick update on Please. where he's at now. But what I, what I talked to him about was, you know, you've been carrying this 500 pound boulder and it's, it's heavy and it's heavy and heavy. And if you step away, the boulder just drops to the ground and the boulder in this analogy is his business. But as soon as you started, he started empowering more people on his team and he had five key people that were trustworthy and trained and you know, we're taking some ownership of our company or our organization, the boulder became a basket. And if one person stepped away, everybody else could could still hold it up. And for him, you know, when I share that, the light the light bulb went off. And I'll say, you know, here we are a couple years later. This man has so much freedom in what he's doing. He's in complete choice with his business. He no longer carries he, he, he maintains a high level strategic planning position as the president, but he no longer is jumping in and doing the $20 hour of work. He knows that he's the MVP and he has the capacity to do the $1,000 an hour work or 
$10,000 an hour work, depending on where he's focusing his energy. So what's happened is he's empowered and elevated key people that over time could be trained, who are trustworthy, who all care almost as much as he did, and maybe some of them as much or more. So instead of having one person with a boulder, you've got you know an entire team holding this lightweight basket and collectively holding each other accountable. And the I think kind of the icing on the cake, it, you know, he's not working seven days a week anymore. And and but the real icing on the cake is it there's synergy now with the collective. And his business has continued to grow more and more profitable and in some ways with less and less of his participation. So I think it's, you know, great, great success for him and his team. You know, it's interesting that starting with that decision that this is a possible alternative, that I don't have to be the one carrying or pushing that boulder up the hill all by myself. What's interesting to me is when we have the model of it's up to me, it's my, 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 me, 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 what happens is the only way forward is to run faster, work harder. But your comment about this basket, the only way, not the only way, the best way forward is to get more strong, competent people. And how do we expand the basket so there's more handles? So we can still carry even a heavier, bigger basket business easily. I love that analogy and that opening. Yeah. Um, yeah. When you look at the common business challenges of a, you know, a lot of your coaching clients struggle with in their companies, what is one other, another common challenge that you see them wrestling with um, in their businesses? Uh, I'll say, you know, if, if I wanted to get really micro, I'd say sometimes pricing, but I think it's sometimes bigger than that. What I notice a lot of times before people come into a coaching program or they, they have an expert looking at their business with fresh eyes without, you know, I can come into a business and I can look without being on the emotional roller coaster. And I see that many times businesses are spread too thin that not all of their products or services are profitable. And most of the time, they have no idea that they're losing potential by, by having too broad of a, a spectrum of product or services you know, being offered. So they can get a little bit too scattered out and not focusing on their sweet spot. And they're losing a lot of potential by having you know, kind of 16 different systems because they've got 16 different products or services. I love that. So I'm hearing from you. We'll come back. Maybe I'll, I'll talk with you about the micro and pricing because I think that's going to be interesting for a lot of viewers or listeners. But this idea that when you come in, you see a business objectively, fresh eyes without the, all the sunk costs of having emotionally committed and you weren't the one who had to develop these 16 different business or service lines that the company has and you don't have any pet projects and you don't know any of the people who are in charge of all that. And what you recognize is by going broad, A, not all things are created equal in terms of profitability. So let's even narrow it down. Let's say we've got five. You know, there's probably one or two that are exceptionally profitable, probably one or two that are very low margin, and maybe one or two are, are in the middle ground. Just simply by cutting or phasing out or, 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 or bottom two or one and reinvesting the energy into our top, that, that's a great one here. Um, when you think about it, this too broad of a focus here, um, I'm curious, what do you think is the root cause of that? When you, and again, as a coach, you get to see that, but what's the real issue that causes a business owner to be so broad? Sometimes it's fear. Like mm. I have a, cl a client, uh, Ginny, and she owns a house cleaning service. And their business serves residential clients, current clients, I mean, commercial clients. Uh, they have gotten into, I mean, their sense changed, but it was, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do your windows in and out. We can bring in carpet cleaning. And it just went on and on. And they never said no to a job that they thought might be a good fit for their team. Yeah. What they didn't think through was we have to buy equipment for this. Somebody has to be trained to do this thing that we've just offered to do, which might only come up eight times a year. And I, I believe that it, the bottom line, it was a, a fear. If we're, not, if we're not meeting our clients' needs, will we continue to sustain this relationship? Will they continue to look 
you know, to us to provide these services. And, yeah, so I think it's this this old mentality that it, every client is so valuable that we have to hold on to them, whatever the cost. Unfortunately, whatever the cost can wind up, you know, costing a business hundreds of thousands of dollars, even more. Yeah. As I hear you talk about that root of fear, you know, if we even go back a few years prior to that, I've noticed or observed with business owners that the early years of the business has an indelible mark it leaves on the business owner. And when they're scrambling to reach the point of profitability, which might have been 28 years prior, they still remember those hungry lean year or two or three years before they reach consistent profitability in the business. And, you know, perhaps in the mm -hmm. very early stages, 28 years ago, you did need to take what you could take to make the business work different economic reality, but your idea of focus, you know, your comment about re residential, commercial windows, flooring, if we add in the flooring cleaning or the window side, you know, not only do we need the equipment and the training, but that, that's interesting, but now we need to have the management systems in place to make sure we keep a high level of quality. We need to have the systems in place of how to sell that effectively. And, and so your comment about, hmm, I want to serve my client starts to pull us broad. And I, I'm, I'm curious, one of the things I've told clients as a coaching client, I've said to them, look, you don't want to leave space for somebody else that's going to compete to come in. I get that. However, you can solve that need by not having a BU, by having a good cross-referral relationship. There might be a great window cleaning company that you've worked with, Acme Windows, and they're phenomenal. You have a good relationship so that they know that you're bringing them business. They give your people good pricing. And maybe they are reciprocal where they'll bring you in to other clients for other contracts for cleaning. What other kinds of coaching would you give to that client who goes too broad about how they might narrow their focus? How do they even know which one to focus on? Let's even start there, Jennifer. What would you, what would you tell them? Yeah. Well, I like to start by suggesting to them that they imagine each one of these uh, products or services that they offer is unto itself its okay. own business. And that allows us to step back and see, okay, what's profitable? What's actually profitable? And then what's my profit margin? And then the next step is, and it's one that people miss frequently, is I might have a product, you know, maybe my third tier product that still will have a good profit margin, but there's also hidden expenses. What if I find out that this particular product always takes my team member three times the amount of time and energy and stress to sustain? So sometimes we're looking just at the dollars and cents and we're not seeing the hidden cost associated. So that's my first step is go, let's take a look at, you know, let's go back and take a look at, you know, just the simplicity of where where your profit margin is on each of these main categories. I'm not talking about, you know, a small line item, but I might silo it out. And then having a conversation with your team, is there any hidden loss or challenge that we're not we're not taking a look at or assessing. And so that might be the first place that I start with them. And then what I'll also have them do is imagine if you had your time back. So there's, you know, there's something, if, if there's seven different things or five different things like your, your suggestion, I don't believe in cutting for the sake of cutting, but I do believe in paying attention if, if removing one of these items is going to free up the time or money to invest in some marketing that's going to, you know, return a better profit margin on one of your silos, it's it's really about using the resources you have in the most productive way. And so it's just, you know, I'll, I'll have them kind of, I tell them, you know, like kind of roll that one in your mouth like a mint after a spicy Mexican food meal. Like let's, let's really think about where your resources could be used best and not just financial, but your team and your time and everything else. So, One of our coaching uh, clients, I, I was brought in to do a guest coaching session. I did two sessions with this guy. Um, Companies doing a little bit over 200 million a year in, in revenue. And he had, I, I believe memory serves me correct, like nine different service lines that he had in his business. And so I had him do the same thing, Jennifer, the, you know, the margin analysis, putting each of these different business lines down, 
with revenue and how much of that is, is gross profit, how much of that is operating profit, and then we can look at the percentages of those margins. We just put them side by side. Um, and then we ask the question, which one had you know, a better future? Similar to what you would ask, what could you do with the time? And so he found certain businesses that were taking a lot of his, for him, his biggest uh, limiting factor was management, his leadership team's ability to effectively manage the various business lines. And what jumped out for him is he thought when he looked at it, he's saying, wow, yes, this particular thing might be making us $3 million of profit, but it sucks up so much of my key number two person's time that if she were to reinvest that to our very best one and in, in managing that one and leading that enterprise better, that might be worth three to five times more profit. Plus, this has a window where it's gonna be closing, the business line's gonna go away eventually based on the industry he's in, where this one is, is blue, blue oceans for a long, long time. So your comment about, imagine you had your time back, how else could you use it? I love that. And I bet your client's like, ooh, I hadn't thought about it that way. Exactly, exactly. And I think, you know, one of the, one of the, the lenses that we could look through, you know, what, because, because I happened to buy a number of businesses that were losing money and, you know, I was under the gun the moment I closed escrow. But one of the, the most empowering lenses to look through when you're looking at your company is to pause and come back and you're looking at your, your P&Ls or your cash flow. And if you can look at it through the lens of, I just bought this company, what could I do better? Many times we'll see things in a glaring way that on a day-to-day -day basis that we didn't notice. And, you know, this is, this is exactly that. And then the other thing, you know, that we kind of touched on a, a baby bit was pricing. Uh, I can't tell you how many times that I have uh, dug into, well, what's your pricing on this particular product line or this service that you have? And how do you know that that's accurate? And when is the last time that you increased your pricing? And I usually tell people, you know, post, post 2020, um, business changed. I mean, we changed, humans changed, business changed, everything changed. And we should now, I believe, be raising our prices at a minimum of once per year, but if not more than one, you know, possibly twice a year. And because we're not the only ones doing it. And I like the idea of being ahead of the curve instead of trying to play catch up. And this is a situation where if you really silo everything out and look at it as if it's its own, you know, product base or its own business, many times you'll see, well, we might be priced well on this, but this other product or service over here, we're losing money on. And uh, hopefully we're not losing money on anything. Right. right. So in a moment, I'm going to ask you for an example of how you work with a client to help them adjust pricing. But I, I can see this here as well. I mean, it's, it's generally speaking with pricing, it's one of three things that stops someone I notice. It's the fear that if they do that, they're going to lose everyone as if we have to raise pricing on every single customer or client at the exact same moment we you know, versus in waves, I hear them say things like, well, I'm already charging the, the most in the market. And what the reality is they haven't really looked at that closely and they, they haven't justified to make it apples to apples. Yes, but when you correct for what you're actually providing versus what someone else is providing, you find that, wow, you're, you're middle of the road for something. And then the final comment I would just say is when they go ahead and do a price increase, they do it really clumsy. But give us an example of you working with a, a client through this um, opportunity and challenge, but this opportunity of raising pricing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm going to give a, a story of a client named Evelyn who has a coaching business. And, and there's much more to that. It. It's a very unique business. But the first question is, when's the last time you raised prices? Oh, you know, we, we raised prices last year. Well, where are you in the marketplace? Well, I found out that Evelyn was charging a hundred dollars, hundred, hundred, hundred fifty dollars for a session. And I said, well, tell me about some successes. So the first thing that I want to get people really grounded in before I just say, raise your prices is reminding themselves where the value is to their clients because we, we are not selling time, we are selling the value of what we're bringing to our clients. And I think that's you know, so important to recognize, even as a coach, if, if I'm 
I might be helping someone, you know, grow revenue on their business, but what I'm really bringing them are, you know, nights where they can sleep, they don't have an ulcer anymore, you know, maybe they're retaining clients longer, uh, or maybe their clients have become strong referral partners, maybe their team is interacting, you know, uh, more cohesively. So I do encourage people to get really, before they start just willy-nilly raising prices, to get more grounded in what value are you bringing? What's what is what's that getting pe for people? And um, my I feel like if we're selling the value, that it's easier for us to adjust the cost. Most people feel more comfortable adjusting prices when they do a little bit of research on where does my fr pricing fit into the marketplace. And it's not that I want people to do extensive studies because I think that if we are experts and we are confident about what we do and we know that we deliver a consistent result over and over and over, I honestly don't feel like it matters so much what anybody else is doing. If I can deliver something that nobody else can consistently, then I know, and I know the value I can sell based on that. But I do, I do uh, give people the freedom of seeing what is in the marketplace, and then again making a conscious decision. Okay, where do you want to be in the marketplace? Do you want to know, be known for being the cheapest company out there, or do you want to be known for being the best? And um, with, you know, with my client, many of her clients were high-powered. Um, CEOs, CFOs, you know, C-suite, uh, founders, and many times uh, attorneys, accountants, educated, successful people. And the one thing that worked for her, and I realize this could be different if you have a, a product, but I said to her, when we talked about her value, I said, why would the value of your time be any less than the value of a high-powered attorney's time? And there was something that clicked for her, that she realized that what their team was bringing to the table didn't hold any less value than her clients. So, it, you know, a, different, a little different with a service business, but I think there's always that something about, you know, where do we want to be in the marketplace? What's the value we're bringing? It's interesting. You talk about where we are in the marketplace. I'm thinking of a, a coaching client of ours I uh, will call this person Dennis. Dennis is a contractor who is, in his world, you know, in contractors, I like to think of them as production people who basically are doing lots of volume, um, mid-grade or lower quality, but doing lots of volume. The, the person who's working on 100 houses versus the person who's the craftsman. Well, this guy, Dennis, was the craftsman. He was doing really complicated work, electrical systems, but he was pricing as if he was... Um, a production person. He was pricing like everybody else. And I just asked him, I said, can anyone else do what you do? Well, no, this type of work is complicated enough that the reason people come to me is because it's not something a typical person would know to do on a commercial building. And I said, great. Then why are you pricing in relationship to people who can't do what you do? It makes no, no sense. And people just don't see this themselves. I love that. So this idea right. of looking at your value provided is a great opener. Um, and one way of doing that is saying, well, if they didn't go with you, who else could really do what you do? And the fewer people the answer, the higher your prices with that. Um, do you ever mm -hmm. find this? I'm curious. I see a lot of clients who will tell me how, for them, they are turning away business because they don't have the production capacity or the, the capacity to service the business. Yet it never occurs to them that one way to play with that is to adjust pricing. And I, I watch it, especially for those people who repeat business with people. Um, one CPA firm we worked with, they had probably half their production capacity of monthly write-up work and, and tax work with half their clients that were very low margin, that were people that had been with them for so long that they had never raised pricing on. And yet these people were demanding mm -hmm. um, more services, scope creep, paid their bills slowly. And I laughed. I said, well, could we take half of those people, a quarter of those people, 12% of your total clients? And could we let them know that they're either going to pay what is a fair rate or they need to go somewhere else and take that freed up time and energy. And these other people that you're turning away, we could start to work with them. I'm curious, do you notice any of your clients who just can't make the connection before you point it out to them between 
the ability to service and or produce enough and, and, and more demand than they can handle and pricing? Do they notice that? Uh, well, not always. <laughs> they don't always know it that on their own. But once you bring, you know, once you shine a light on that, they can see the opportunity. And I have worked with several clients who, you know, just hadn't raised. We couldn't raise the prices. These people have been with us forever. These were our foundational people, and they had all these ideas about what they couldn't do. And when they took a leap and I said, look, if you're if you're really feeling anxious about it, don't raise 100 percent of this collective that you can't do anything with. Start with 20 percent. See how that goes. See what percentage of those clients you lose. And I I can't tell you how many clients took decided to take the leap of faith raise their prices in some cases that hadn't been increased in years. Maybe they raised it 20 percent, 30 percent, 40 percent, depending on the business. And what happened was, yes, they did lose some of those, uh, some of their clients. That's true. But what ended up happening was they were working less and making more. And that that's that's not something that's uncommon. Of course, you know the the, the money math has to work, but it's not uncommon. And it's also not uncommon. You mentioned this earlier. You know, what if we didn't do everything and maybe we outsource? Uh, I have helped a great number of clients re re create referral relationships where they are. You know, they might get an opportunity or maybe they even have the clients in house and they're just no longer a great fit for them once they increase their their uh, pricing or their services get more fine tuned. And I have had clients create referral relationships with other companies where they're getting, you know, everything from a 10 percent kickback to a 35 or 40 percent kickback for the referral. And these companies who are, you know, who are basically giving the payment they're thrilled they didn't have to go on google they didn't have to create a facebook ad they didn't have to i mean they're they're getting a warm lead someone that you know nine times out of the ten is going to close so they're not spending six months in the in the process of romancing a client the close is pretty fast and i have clients that are making you know tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars for just passing along a client that's not a great fit for them but is a great fit for their referral partner. And I got to tell you, between you imagine me fine tuning a little bit, raising your prices, making more, and then not having the clients that aren't a good fit anymore and still making more. I mean, you know, would bring some people to tears. It's just it's an ex Absolutely. it's exciting when you're looking from a different perspective. And, and for those people who are running a business where they have some legacy customers and they feel really beholden to them, you, know, you mentioned those early years, the founding customers and so forth. I watch, like, I'll give an example, Jennifer. We had a, a woman we coached, Bonnie, who ran an occupational therapy practice. And in her world, in her two clinics, the, the times after school but before 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock at night were like her prime hours because she worked with children. And so for her... If she really needs to work with somebody and she, she wants to give them a break on price, my coaching for her was, well, don't give them your prime window hours that you have a waiting list for. If, if you're going to give them a break in pricing because you feel um, compelled to do so, then let them give you something of value by doing the filler times, the more flexible hours. Maybe it's in the morning or on the weekend time that maybe someone else, it's harder for you to fill. And her first response was, well, they can't do that either. Well, hang on a second. If this is important to them and they can't pay the full freight price, this is a way to indirectly get something back of value, even though you're not charging as much as you do for your other clients. Um, I guess I'm going to shift gears here. What's something you watch business owners? Um, well, let's, actually, I'm going to change that a little bit here. So moving on here. In today's world, what are some of the trends that this is a, I'm throwing you a curveball, but you, hey, you're, you're this person that okay. can handle curveballs here. When we think about marketing sure. in today's world and clients that you work with in terms of ways that they've generated business in today's market, today's world. I'm curious, what are some of the things, and I'll give an example for it, that you've seen be really effective for some of your coaching clients to generate more business in a stranger world with that? And I'll give an example for it. 
you know, a medical practice he worked with, Brian runs his medical group. He never thought or occurred to him to actually look at uh, just side by side what, what historically of the different lead sources he's had had been the, the ones that have produced the most profitable patients for his, his surgical practice. So by going back and, and looking at you know, 12 months, six months, three months of data, he discovered number one, insights about where to put energy, but number two, he discovered where he was inadequately even having a staff track that he could now fix so that going forward, three months from now, six months from now, he'll have much better data that won't take him so much effort to try to create. Share some of the ideas that have been working with the clients you've been working with on the marketing front. Yeah, so I guess there's a few a few things that I can say on that. So the first thing I'll say is uh, it's n not a surprise to me, but what's old is new again and is sometimes working very successfully. I mean, we've all got to a point where most of us feel a little email fatigue. So we're not getting the traction with our email that we once did because people are tired of looking at all the emails. What, what I am seeing getting traction again is, is our uh, postcards. And you know, so, someone who's a 35 year old in business may have never remembered that, hey, that was <laughs> one of the mail, old ways Jennifer? of doing I'm too business. Young. Is there a postal service? Yeah, right? <laughs> Right. But, but I'm seeing people depends on the type of business they're getting traction. Uh, I was talking to a client today and they have an exterior remodel business. They do siding and windows and a little bit of, um, you know, landscaping work and things like that. And we were, to, you know, they did a little sampling and they said, I can't believe it, but we're going to go back to door knocking. And they, they're getting tra they're getting traction for that. And what we were talking about was, you know, kind of clever ways to find salespeople. And um, uh, they were on a Facebook group for salespeople, or if I think we were talking about Instagram, they were on a, a salesperson's group on Instagram. And there was a, a 19 year old kid holding up a check for $18,000, which was this 19 year old's commission from knocking doors for solar panel sales. So we're, I think we're getting, you know, we've gotten so far away from connection and everything's become so digitized that in some ways, some of these old ways of business are doing. I have another client who's getting great leads from radio. Who would have thunk, right? So I'm not saying the old ways are the only ways. On the flip side of the coin, I love the way that people are implementing AI right now. Um, uh, you know, just being able to type in, if you're, uh, this is a, a, a client of mine who has a business, a coffee service business, and he can just go into AI and say, give me all of the names of businesses with over, you know, with over 50 employees uh, who enjoy coffee. I mean, I don't know how AI actually knows that, but he's able to come up with a list of places that he would have never even considered maybe in their in their outreach. I am seeing businesses do really well with um, telemarketers, with having aggregator, businesses that are aggregators doing telemarketing outreach. Uh, one of my clients pays between 50 and $150 for some pretty quality leads. And on average, they can close about one out of every six leads, but their profit on an average job is about $8,000. So they're getting, you know, I would say there's jobs where they're making $15,000 of profit, but you know, the numbers to me are very obvious. Um, I'm not seeing people get the same results with their Facebook ads as they used to. So, you know, that's, that's a little bit different. Um, let me think what else is really working for people right now. Uh, I have, I have a handful of clients who, have gone to commissioned only salespeople, or they might have a training period where people get paid for two months so that they can, you know, really be efficient and knowledgeable about product service company. And then they're going full commission, but the commissions are, you know, they're, I would say substantial, but no more substantial than, than if someone was, uh, you know, advertising investing money in Google. So 
I guess what I'll say is there is a blend between a digital approach, you know, and still having some human beings involved. And I think that's going to look different from business to business, but I'll kind of, I mean, I could, I could go on this for, you know, a whole hour about what I'm seeing is working, but I will say, um, I think most importantly, one of the things that I insist people do, whatever they're doing, is start tracking their marketing and figure out what's working. And it's as simple as how did you hear about us or having a place on an intake form of some sort with five choices that people can tick off. But if we don't know what's working today, and it makes it harder for us to determine where to invest. And then I guess the last thing I'll say is, boy, once you figure out what that is, if you've got a marketing campaign on Facebook that works and you know the cost of a lead is makes sense for you, I'm telling people double, triple, quadruple, 10x down and ride that wave as long as you can because it's not going to last. So, you know, we have to be much more agile than we were, especially with our digital approaches. Um, we have to stay much more on top of it because we don't always have a two year or five year or 10 year trajectory like we might have in 10 years ago. So we have to just be on top of it and be agile, be willing to tra change it up, know where our limitations are. That was golden ideas. I actually have a page and a half of notes here, starting off with what's, <laughs> this is your quote from you, Jennifer, what's old is new again. I love it. Like the, the things that we forget about, direct mail, an actual phone call, door knocking. Um, I've told some of our contractor clients, put up door hangers around the, you know, the, the two block radius of any job that you've got, signage. All this old school stuff that, mm -hmm. that that has become fresh again. I love it. Your idea of the Instagram group right. for salespeople. You know, if I were, if, if one of my key hires in my world were salespeople, you just gave me the idea. What about creating a meetup for salespeople? What about this, that I could just meet these people for my hiring bench? That was brilliant. I love that idea. And your 19 year old mm -hmm. holding his yeah. check for a big one for, for selling solar. Someone, if I, that, that's an interesting way of doing recruiting. I know that wasn't the, necessarily the, the theme behind it. Your comments about AI inside of pulling lead lists and um, the, the, and I think uh, the tracking, but the, the idea of tracking that I heard from you that I loved was once you've determined a winner, be bold. Pay attention because that mm -hmm. winner, especially in the digital space, is going to change faster. And, and this has hurt some clients I know who said, oh, I used to get all my, leads from SEO, then Google changes its algorithm and all of a sudden where they had a thousand leads a month turned into a hundred leads and they feel out of control with that part of it. Well, they took advantage where they could, but recognize that none of these lead sources and these lead strategies are going to work forever and being agile. I love that. That was really, mm -hmm. really sage counsel. Um, yeah. Last question I have for you, Jennifer, you've been so wonderful sharing your time. What would you say to the business owner who they hear all these things, they have these ideas, and Jennifer, they say, I love to the idea of growing my business, increasing profitability, increasing my owner independence, but they still have this nagging doubt, is it possible for me? I can see, Jennifer, it's possible for the people you coach. I can see it's possible for all these other people. I can see that, that that's true and, and real, but they still have a nagging doubt or fear, is it possible for them? What would your last message be to that person? Uh, probably the same. Probably the same message that I'll give. I had a lot of real estate clients in the last year. I was doing a lot of webinars for realtors, and I said, I said, if you go to the multiples, there are, you know, there are. It doesn't matter what the economy is. There's always going to be homes or buildings that are closing. Someone's getting that business. Why not you? And I think if someone's doubting this, why not you? What does every other business owner that's having great success have that you don't, except for one thing, a, will, a willingness to maybe stretch, get a little bit out of their own way and try something different. And I'll, I'll just say from personal experience, you don't have to go it alone. Uh, it took me until my fourth company to hire an expert to help me. And at the time, I thought it was expensive. 
and it didn't take me very long to realize that it was worth every penny. So fantastic, um, you know, have connect with a peer group. You, you just have to take that first step. Find a first step, but don't go it alone. Find yourself some peers. They don't have to know everything, but sometimes as business owners, we're, we pretend a lot. We pretend everything's okay. Sometimes we pretend with our spouse and our kids and our neighbors and our friends, and then we're at the top, so we're not telling anybody else at the company, uh-oh, you know, I lost, we're, we're down 28%. So I'll say, you know, why not you? You're, you know, find, find some support. Don't go it alone. Uh, you know, don't wait. Don't wait, you know. So have a have a destination that you'd like to get to, that you believe is possible, and then don't you don't be the thing that holds you back from freedom. So that would be probably my best best thing to say. That's fantastic, Jennifer. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us, and for sharing your insights, and mostly just sharing your way of being in the world. I love the way you move through the world. I, I don't think I've ever told you this. But probably five or six years ago, you said something that really stayed with me, which is you said that the most important thing in an area, and we were having a conversation, was to know what you want and be willing to ask for what you need. And I can't tell you the number of times early on that, that after you had said that, that I kind of repeated that to myself to the point today where I feel like it's kind of been absorbed. Um, and I tell my kids now, hey, like one of my sons, Matthew, he, he tends to be a little bit... Um, shrinks himself in the world. And I say to him, hey, Matthew, it's okay to ask for what you want and need. And I just wanted to say thank you. Mm -hmm. You were the one that gave me that spark. Maybe, maybe other people had said it before, but for whatever reason, when you said it six, five or six years ago, it really did stay with me. So I want to personally say thank you for that. Well, thank you. That's great. And just in a moment, I guess apparently I had brilliance. So that's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, David. I appreciate More than that. A moment. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Well, you enjoy mm -hmm. the world out there in North Carolina. I hear that uh, a, a mutual acquaintance had shared that you have an Apple Festival coming up in North Carolina soon. I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> thank you for everything you do for business thank owners. You. and Thank you for sharing your time, expertise, and way of being here today on The Business Coach. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you.